It is week 13 of this NFL season, and the Ravens have a one o'clock matchup inside MT Bank Stadium with the Denver Broncos. And to help us preview this matchup, we're thrilled to welcome in former Ravens, former Super Bowl winning Raven, Brandon Stokely. Stoke, thanks for uh, making your debut on the vault, man. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Um, so uh, take it easy on me. <laughs> Let's begin with this. It's kind of a, a softball to start, and I'm, you've talked about this ad nauseum, I'm sure, with Zach on your local show in Denver. But this whole marriage between Russ and the cooking that Russ does in Denver and, and everything that's taken place in recent months hasn't exactly aligned yet. Why? Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, it's been awful. Uh, there's been no cooking, uh, obviously. It's been it's been really bad. Um, you know, it, it's hard to pinpoint one thing uh, of why it's gone so wrong. And obviously with the trade, there were so much expectations here in Denver. Um, you had a new coach coming from Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers. You know, it was like the expectations were so high here in Denver that you finally found your quarterback been looking for one since Peyton left after 2015 in the Super Bowl then, and it just hasn't hasn't even come close to working out. Uh, you go back to training camp, we were very critical of how they operated in training camp, and it was one of the easiest training camps I've ever seen. And so, you know, I come from the Peyton Manning school of offensive football. It's hard. It's tough. And you got to grind day in and day out. And uh, they just weren't doing that during training camp, and I think that's part of it. Uh, and I, us here in Denver, we're just we're we're hoping that Russ, you know, hasn't hit his best, and now he's on the downside of his career. Uh, that's where we're at right now here in Denver, uh, hoping that it's just something with this offense. It's just not a good fit. Um, Nathaniel Hackett, you know, he's not going to be here next year. I just don't see any way possible that that's going to work out, and he's going to have year two. So. You're kind of holding out hope here in Denver that you get the right fit for Russ with this new coach and a new offense uh, next year. Well, there's a lot of things we can take from that, um, especially Hackett. Maybe we'll come back to that in just a second. So you talked about, you know, just the expectations based off of contract and the fact that the Broncos just sold the farm. So many yep. things to, to get him out of Seattle to come to Denver. You know, I was looking up his contract today just because, you know, we're the outside looking in. It doesn't even look like there's a realistic out of that contract to like 2026. And even then it would be a lot of dead money. So I guess what you're saying here is with Hackett, Hackett, maybe another coordinator. I mean, what is the hope? Is it a new coordinator that Russ will turn it on next year? Like what else can they do? Yeah, not much. You know, you're stuck with Russ. I mean, his new contract, I mean, he had two years remaining on his existing contract when they traded for him from uh, Seattle and they redid it and they added, you know, five more years to that contract, uh, 266 million, something like that, 144 guaranteed. Um, and so they added that to the two years. So, you know, right now this is still year one of seven years. So you got two more, you got another year after that of his old contract, then the new contract kicks in. So, it's uh, it's a tough deal. I mean, you know, there's no way of getting around it. It's it's you're stuck with Russ. You know, I looked at it and it's probably for three years at the minimum, you know, at the best. And then you would have to eat a 40 million dollar cap hit um, after that if he's really done, done. So right now, moving forward, the Broncos position has to be to find a new coach that can get the best out of Russell Wilson. That's you're all in with Russ. He's not going anywhere um after this year so you're stuck with him for a few more years at least you know and it might be like like you said it might be longer than that so you're gonna have to try to find a coach to uh, get the best out of him and whether that's an offensive coach um or you know that coach hires a coordinator you're gonna have to try to find an offense that fits russ because what they're doing right now it, it's not even close i mean this is the worst it's been here since Peyton Manning, and it's been bad around here. You know, I mean, we've had quarterback after quarterback every single year. It's been a new quarterback, and it's been awful. And this is the worst that it's been. They're the worst scoring offense in the NFL. I mean, like, how can it? And you and you got a franchise quarterback um, with a guy like Russell Wilson. How is that even possible? Uh, so that's 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 the issues here. And you know, people are scratching their heads of 
why it's so bad, how it has gotten to be uh, where we are right now. And it's, it's a head scratcher. Well, Stoke, who else is to blame besides Russ? I mean, as offensive line, I, mean, I feel like we should be able to answer this on our own without you because oh, of how yeah. many times these, this team has played on primetime, right. dude. I mean, this, this there's been so many primetime games, I feel like, through the first half of the season. But um, what what's led to this aside from Russ's play? Have there been other contributing factors? Certainly. You know, they've had injuries, but every team has injuries. I mean, you think Baltimore didn't have a ton of injuries last year and doesn't have injuries this year. I mean, it's it's the NFL, right? No one really cares. It's like, did you win enough games or did you not? But certainly there's been injuries that have impacted this football team. They just don't have the depth um, to overcome those injuries, unfortunately. And Russ hasn't played well enough to lift up the other guys. You know, you're hoping when you have that type of quarterback that he can lift up the guys that maybe certain people – hadn't heard of and make them better. But uh, the injuries have happened and uh, Russ hasn't been able to uh, pick up the slack and lift up the other guys that um, have taken those guys places. So it's uh, it's been a combination of a lot of things. Um, it's just not one thing here. It's the injuries, the offense is just uh, not very good. Russ is not playing very good at all. Uh, he looks lost, whether it be his footwork, his reads, his progressions, his decision making, all of all of the above. You know, when you're in, um, oh, I know when I was in like middle school and they had A, B, C, and then they had like none of the above or all of the above. It's just like you know, screw it. Let me just go with all of the above. That's where we're at here. It's like all of the above. Everything, everything is to blame. Wow. Hey, Brandon, you you had <laughs> mentioned that the, the offense is number thirty two in points per game. The defense is number three in points allowed per game. Do you get any sense that maybe the locker room, is, especially on the defensive side, I'm just thinking of Mike Purcell kind right. of, you know, getting after Russell Wilson. Do you feel like that interaction between them might be indicative of what's happening? Like, do you feel like there's any resentment from the defense over to the offensive side? Well, it's hard for me to say. You know, I'm not in that locker room, but you can sense it, you know, uh, because the defense has, has been a good defense. Let's, you know, don't fool yourself with that stat, uh, but – you know, with the, they were leading the league and giving up points, and the Broncos were the worst in scoring points a couple weeks ago. Uh, they've had a hard time stopping the run the last couple weeks. They are a good defense. They're not a great defense. Um, and I think a lot of teams game plan to just say, let's not screw this thing up. Uh, if we can score 20 points, we'll win. I mean, that, I mean, that's the bottom line. So, But you can kind of sense some frustration there. And, you know, I can't really blame them. When you're losing – expectations were high and defense is playing good enough to win games. And you look at the offense and they are playing the way the Broncos offense is playing. You're going to be frustrated. And the expectations were there. Russell's making a ton of money and he's not delivering. He's underperforming. And so there's, um, there's got to be some frustration there from the defense. And I think you saw a little bit of that with Mike Purcell last week in Carolina um, and, and how he was yelling at Russ. I don't know exactly what he said, but, there's certainly there's frustration there with, with the way the offense is playing and the way the Russ is playing. So, you know, the only way to remedy, remedy that is to win football games. When you're not winning games, you're going to have some of that stuff happen. And we got to circle back to a couple of those comments you made right off the jump from uh, regarding Nathaniel Hackett, because I got to be honest, going all the way back to the introductory press conference, I remember watching it. He was kind of fanboying over Russ, I felt like that day. And I was like, is this really the first impression that he's given off? And then, of course, you're watching the, the kind of the, 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 the meltdown, clock management, game management kind of things in the early going of this season. So at this point, entering week 13, you, you one, don't think he's going to be around for a year or two. And two, what is the temperature? I mean, that's you, but what's the fan base's temperature around this guy right now? I mean, the fan base wanted them gone four or five weeks ago. You know, I mean, they're fed up. I mean, they are fed up here in Broncos country. So, um, you know, it's yeah, it's it's his philosophy just hasn't worked. Um, overall, he seems like a really good guy. The players like him. The players want to play hard for him, uh, but it's just not working out. And uh, at some point. You know, we talked a lot about this. Um, he's the guy that's giving out hugs. He's the positive guy. He's the guy that always has a smile on his face. Well, what happens when things start going bad? Are you still giving out these t these hugs every day and you still operating this way? And that's where we're at right now. And 
at a certain point, you know, there has to be a discipline, disciplinarian um, aspect of this thing as a head coach. You got to be able to put your foot down. And I don't know if he's able to do that. And we, we you know, you, you look at the Melvin Gordon situation and a few weeks ago and, um, you know, he's he's not playing. He's kind of pouting on the sideline. And then next thing you know, he's starting the next week. It just doesn't make sense. And then now, you know, after he fumbled for, you know, who knows how many times they finally uh, cut him but it's like a little bit too little too late there. So it just hasn't been a good fit for Nathaniel Hackett as a head coach this year. Uh, Unfortunately, Uh, it's not good news here in Denver. You don't want to change coaches, but I don't see any other avenue for this new ownership. I mean, this ownership that took over um, didn't hire Nathaniel Hackett. You know, they inherited Nathaniel Hackett. He was hired before they bought the team. And so, you know, they've got to be looking at the situation like, ooh, this is, you know, this is not good. They have to be embarrassed. You know, all those, you know, the things that you brought up from the first game on, the Broncos have been under the spotlight. And that's not a good thing when you're not performing well and your head coach isn't performing well. And and that's just the NFL. And so everyone knows what you're signing up for in the NFL. And unfortunately, Nathaniel Hackett hasn't delivered. And I don't think there's any um, – I can't find a reason um, uh, or, or – uh, anything to, to to signal that he'll be back for year two. It's just you can't sell that to the fan base. Yeah. So switching gears a little bit here, uh, Patrick Sertain. Now, he's somebody that you're kind of looking at from out here. The Ravens passing game hasn't, you know, been on fire. What do, what do you feel like he's done so far in his career? And, you know, just on the outside looking in, you know, sometimes because we're always looking at cornerback list, like we want to see, you know, Marlon Humphrey up there or right. Marcus Peters, but we saw one the other day that had Patrick Sertain pretty up pretty pretty high up there. Would you put him as like a top five CB? How is his career going? Yeah, no, he's been great in year two. Um, uh, he's been great. He, he's everything advertised. Um, you know, from Alabama first round pick, and uh, he's long, he's strong, he'll tackle, uh, he can cover, he's fast. Uh, so he's that prototypical new age uh, cornerback. Uh, he. He's, he's given up a couple touchdowns the last couple weeks. I think everybody saw a couple weeks ago the walk-off touchdown in overtime to Devontae Adams. It happens. Uh, gave up a touchdown last week uh, to DJ Moore in Carolina. But he's the real deal. He's great. Um, and he, he goes about his business the right way. He's a true pro. His dad played in the NFL. Me and his dad actually played in the Louisiana High School All-Star game together years ago. Um, so, Look, I mean, he comes from a, a, a football family, and he, he, he checks all the boxes for, for a cornerback, and he's going to be a great cornerback for a long, long time. He can do it all. At what point did you come to terms, Stoke, that these guys that are playing out there right now, you were playing with their pops? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, I'm old, man, yeah. getting old. It's, it stinks. <laughs> uh, it stinks. It's not fun, uh, but that's when you really know you're getting old. You're looking at these rosters and you're saying, well, how many of these guys have I actually played with? There's still a few that I've played with. And, uh, you know, Derek Wolf, who was in Baltimore the last couple of years, he, he's on our radio station now. And uh, he was talking about Brandon Williams uh, today, uh, mm-hmm. just signed with the Chiefs, I believe. And I was like, I was teammates with him. So that gets me excited when I can see some of my former teammates that are actually still playing my last year was there in Baltimore in 2013. I know everybody remembers that year that I had. It was such a memorable year for me. Um, and so, but, you know, we're almost 10 years later, and there's still a few guys that I was teammates with. So, uh, but, yeah, man, getting old, getting old. It's not fun. Mm, yeah. Your, your programming director over there at the fan, Raj Sharon's putting together one heck of a lineup, man. You guys are you're crushing it. He's from Columbia, Maryland. I've gotten to know Raj through Zach, your, your radio partner over the years. So there's a lot of inroads here. But uh, speaking of kind of like keeping yourself young and whatnot, your boy Peyton's doing exactly that with Manning Cast and all of his ventures when, within this, this digital and social world that he's putting together. Eli as well. But he made some um, some comments recently that uh, made headlines about Greg Roman, Ravens offensive coordinator, who's in the news right now today for other reasons related to a potential the, the vacancy out there at Stanford. But you think from the outside looking in of, of Greg Roman's philosophy, what he's done in Baltimore, and I guess this is the case in every market, but the fan base is just he's an easy target, man. They're all over him. But I guess that's the case like with every coordinator in every market. 
Yeah, it, no, it really is. Look, I mean, it's a hard profession, and uh, you, you get scrutinized for everything that you do, right? It's not easy, but you get paid a lot of money, um, and that's just part of the business, and uh, that's what you sign up for, uh, unfortunately, whether you're a player or a coach. It's just the way it goes. Um, and, you know, watching the Ravens um, offensively for me from afar, you know, I don't watch them play in and play out like I do the Broncos, Um but there's some things there that have me scratching my head and offensively, especially in their passing game. Uh, there, there's too much gray area. And when I say that, you know, I mean, you know, the quarterback and receiver aren't on the same page, whether it be a, a drag route, you know, a five yard drag route going left to right. And the receiver sits down and Lamar throws it out in front of him. Um, certain things like that. I just see too much with this Ravens passing game and, um, I know, you know, like I said, I, I grew up under Peyton Manning. You know, that was my best years, and I learned a lot from him. And there was no gray area. This is how we're doing it. This is what we're going to do. And you repped it over and over and over again. So it was second nature. And when you're in the film room, if you were at 11 yards, you're supposed to be at 12 yards. Hey, guess who spoke up? Peyton Manning spoke up, right? Um, so there's no gray area in, with, 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 with a guy like Peyton Manning. And, you know, we weren't perfect, but that's what made our offenses click. That's what made us who we were. And I see too much gray area with the Baltimore Ravens. And, and sometimes with a guy like Lamar Jackson, yeah, you can freelance, right, because he's extending plays and, and doing all these things, But and which is great, you know, playing a little bit of backyard football. That's that's awesome. But when, when it comes time when you have got to throw the football and you're down seven, you're down ten, and it's the third quarter, can you execute the passing game at a high level? And I just don't see enough of that with the Ravens. And that's what has me so confused because they have so much talent. And But that comes back to just working. And that goes to the offseason. You know, I know Lamar wasn't there much in the offseason, and, and some guys aren't there. You know, you saw Aaron Rodgers not be there this offseason. And, and he's got a lot of young receivers. You see what their offense looks like. They stink offensively. They're all over the place. So it, 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 playing offensive football in the NFL is hard. It's not easy. And so I think when you miss the offseason program, it starts to show up. And they need to be cleaner in their drop back passing game for me. And I don't know what it is. I don't, you know, I don't know um, the, the why because I'm not in those meetings. Uh, but it, it's got to be cleaner. If they want to take that next step and win a championship, you don't do it by um, doing what they're doing right now, um, certainly, because they have too much talent. They have too good of a running game to not be better in the passing game. I mean, you look out there, it's man-to-man. -man. It's one-on-one -on -one because everybody's stacking the box and putting eight, nine guys in the box to stop the running game. So as a receiver, I love that. It's time to eat. Let's go. And it's just not good enough. I don't know why. Well, and just to be clear, Plate Manning, he made headlines because he was – praising greg roman <laughs> it wasn't because he was like yeah. it was like Peyton the opposite everyone that's what he yeah. does that's why everybody loves Peyton Manning. he praises everyone i mean that's what he does that's not what i do that's not yeah. what i do you gotta you know, be the he, villain but, stoke you, but, you always but, need a villain but, but, yeah but I'm, I'm the bad guy peyton's the nice yeah. guy that's why that's why he's never had me on the manning cast you know that's why he's never had me on because he knows how I'll, I'll, I'll just be real and i'm gonna call him out so you know, hey. So you can't you can't believe him like the same thing with Bill Belichick. He just likes to praise his opponents, and then he makes right. you feel good just until yeah. he can come and uh, yeah get you. So that's right. That's right. Hey, yeah, yeah. So just speaking a little bit more of the offense, your impressions of Lamar Jackson. I know. I always like to ask people in other markets. Um, I mean, especially after that 2019 season, everybody was just so scared of him. Do you feel like? This Broncos defense are, are, is scared of him. What is the impression of him out in, in Denver or your impression of him? Oh, yeah. I mean, you got to be, you got to fear Lamar Jackson. I mean, he's as talented as they get. I mean, he can do it all. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, you, you saw the throw to uh, Deshaun Jackson uh, mm -hmm. last week. I mean, I mean, he, he can throw the ball down the field. Um, and, and obviously, with his legs and that running game, you got to respect it and you fear it. You do. And if you're the Denver Broncos, they really fear that running game. So they'll load the box. And I mean, every week, I guarantee you, every defense coordinator is saying, hey, make Lamar Jackson beat you with his arm. Let's try to shut down this running game. It's easier said than done, obviously, because they got a dynamic running game. They do so many things, whether it's a fullback, the running back, 
or Lamar taking off. And then all of a sudden you got Andrews, you know, working in the middle of the football field. So, but you got to have some guys on the outside that can win one-on-one. And, and, and that's the bottom line and press coverage man to man, but that's the time to go as a wide receiver. I mean, there's no better looks than going one-on-one with someone. And I just don't see them winning enough in, in, in uh, when you see those types of defenses. Uh, but certainly with Lamar Jackson, I mean, Look, I mean, he's awesome, um, and he, he he can do it all. But to me, you got to clean up a few of the little things, the small things, not the big things, just the small things. That's what separates being good to great, right? It's just the little things, and that's in everything in life. And so for me, um, like I said, it's it's that gray area, and it's just cleaning up those things. And if they do that, um, now, now you look at like that 2019 team with, you know, that's the year that he led the league in, in passing touchdowns, I believe. Uh, mm-hmm. so, I mean, they, they were, they were unbelievable that year. Uh, but for some reason you just don't see the same, whether it's, you know, you don't have Hollywood Brown, you don't have some of the same weapons, but still you got to make it work. Uh, if you're the Ravens in the passing game, because you got too good of looks. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's what you want as a wide receiver. And for some reason you don't see that passing game consistent enough and, and and if you want to win a super bowl which i know they do that's the standard uh, over there in baltimore you got to that passing game has got to be cleaned up a little bit stoke let's just say you were a 2022 wide receiver right now still in your heyday still in your playing days would you want to play for this organization oh you're darn right i would i mean heck yeah look i'm getting the best looks ever you know because of the quarterback like, you know, when I played with Peyton, everyone was saying, run the football, run the football. We're just not going to let Peyton beat you with his arm. And they played soft cover, too. You, you had, you had you know, coverages to take away the passing game. In Baltimore, they don't care about the passing game. They're trying to stop the run. So you're getting one-on-one. That's what I loved. And that's what, as a receiver, that's what you got to love. Me against you, you got really no help over the top. You might have one middle-of-the-field safety. That's it. So, Yeah. I'm for that all day, every day. Um, and and that's what you love to see as a wide receiver. And, you know, it's like, hey, me against you, best man wins. Uh, but for me, yeah, that's what I'm all about. Let's go. <laughs> they got to call you up. Man. They got to call him up now, Sarah. I mean, come on. They, they, well, I hear they got a spot open. Well, I, 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 <laughs> Deshaun Jackson, and- Brandon Stokely, let's take let's take all the well, guys. I, I'm a little bit older than Deshaun, uh, but you know, I, Ozzy <laughs> called me up in 2013 and brought me in for my last array. And you know, I felt good in camp, but you know, I didn't make it much in, in during the season before my body broke down. So I don't think the Ravens are going to call me up anymore. <laughs> Hey, hey, Brandon. So we're gonna have major Ravens- problems if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, obviously, the Ravens are heavy, heavy favorites for this game. But what would have to go right? What would it take to be like the keys for the Broncos? I mean, look, the Jags just did it. Not many people thought the Jags would beat the Ravens. Yeah. So, what would need to go right if 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 Russell Wilson were to turn it on? Hey man, if you just stick around until the fourth quarter, who knows what's going to happen with the Ravens this year? Right. What has what what needs to happen for the Broncos to win? Everything, everything. Broncos stink. <laughs> Broncos stink. Uh, and yeah, the Ravens <laughs> lost me a lot of money last week. So thanks a lot. You know, uh, so um, they did. They cost me a lot of cash last week losing that football game. So uh, I'm not happy with them right now. Uh, but I mean, everything has to go right for the Denver Broncos. I mean, obviously, they are the worst offense in the NFL. Uh, they are. Uh, so like the Ravens would have to turn the ball over three or four times. The Ravens would have to give up a couple big, big touchdowns down the field. The Broncos can't drive from the 20 to the end zone. They just can't do it without screwing it up. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they might kick a field goal, but they can't do that consistently enough unless you give them freebies, unless you turn the football over and screw things up. If you just don't screw things up, there's no chance that the Ravens lose this football game. None. So there you go. Hey, Sarah, I think we can wipe out the prediction part of our script here. Because well, I, I just wanted to hear a score, though. I need to hear a score. What's the what's the predicted score, Brandon? A lot to a little. I got it like 27-10, 27-13, uh, right okay. around there. Wow. Um, that's what it should be. Now, you know, it's the NFL. Anything can happen. We see crazy things happen every week. But – 
Um, yeah. I just can't see something this crazy happening. I just can't. Uh, the Broncos consistently have been a bad offense. Um, if they score 20 points, you know, uh, we might throw a parade here in Denver. I mean, that's how bad it is. I'm telling you, that's how bad it is. So, like, if, if the Ravens could score 23 points, there's no chance that they lose. Uh, we'll see. They are not blowing out teams at all this year. So we'll see if that ends up being the case. Right hey, listen, the Broncos got a hit right game. So, look, if you're struggling, you want the Denver Broncos on your schedule. This is just the truth. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm not trying to make jokes here. This is the truth. Uh, Carolina Panthers, hey, you know, I know I know the Ravens only beat them 13-3, and it was a close game, but they stink. Um, Balt- uh, Denver goes up there last week and – you know, I mean, it was a blow. It was blowout city. I mean, it, 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 the Broncos. I mean, that game was over at halftime. So it's it's a get right game. Deontay Foreman looked like Earl Campbell running the football against the Broncos. So <laughs> look, I mean, like like well, what are we talking about here? If the if the, if the Ravens don't yeah. rush for over two hundred yards and score twenty something points and don't give up more than thirteen points, I mean, look, I mean that that would be um, uh, depressing if you're Baltimore. Sarah, you think he's just catering to our audience or or what here? Or come he's on. doing the Bill Belichick thing here. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, no, yeah. no. I'm just Something's telling going you on. Truth. I'm just shooting you straight here. I'm like, <laughs> this is what we say on air every day. Unfortunately, this is what we talked about. You know, we talk about Broncos uh, 24-7. Um, and, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in watching the every game. And, unfortunately, they've been a disaster this year. Look at their record. I mean – Look, points per game with Russell Wilson, they are last in the NFL. How is that even possible? Uh, how many hmm. times have they scored 20 points or more? I think they've scored 20 points or more once or twice at the most. Um, so it's been um, – I think it's twice. I think it's twice. But it, it, it's it's – And one of them might have been the overtime game, right? Yeah, it's, they did – They I know they did it, I think, against uh, the, uh, Vegas, their first meeting against uh, the Raiders, and they lost. Um, so – it's uh, it's it's just it's really bad. I mean, it's really bad. So yeah. unless you screw yeah. things up, and I think that's most of the teams that go in and play the Broncos. You know, they're watching all these films, of course, and they're saying, "Hey, let's just not screw this up offensively. Let's be really conservative and take care of the football, and we'll win a game. We'll win the game." I mean, because the yeah. Broncos can't score points. You need to score points, right, to win in the NFL. I mean, it's 2022. <laughs> You're supposed to be able to score points. Right. I mean, it's built. The league is built to score points right now, and the Broncos. You know, they're averaging like 13, 14 points a game. All right, let's finish here because we've kept you long enough and we can keep going and going and going on this, but we'll we'll save that for you you and the radio show there. Uh, what should we expect from the 30 for 30 doc coming out on your 2000 Ravens? Are you going to be involved? Should we be as fired up as everybody seems to be? What's going on with that? They didn't call me. I don't know. I'm not involved at all, um, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it doesn't bother me, uh, but but at the same time, I'm looking forward to it. I, I can't wait to see it, you know, because I'm sure they'll have a lot of stuff that I've forgotten about that I don't remember. Uh, that was a long time ago. And so, I, I'm man, I'm so looking forward to it and can't wait to see it. And, you know, we were supposed to have our reunion, of, you know, I don't know, a couple of years ago, COVID hit, couldn't go down, and we, you know, and, and get all the guys together. We did a Zoom thing, just not quite the same. So... I can't wait to see some of the um, some of the, the the stuff that they have uh, because it was a special team, great group of guys, fun group of guys, and you know it was my second year in the NFL. I mean, gosh, uh, and I was just a baby, and uh, I couldn't imagine playing in the Super Bowl. And then there we were, playing in the Super Bowl and winning the Super Bowl, and uh, just you know one of the greatest times of my life and so to be able to relive that and 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 look back and see some of some of that stuff that I've forgotten about I, I can't I can't wait for it so I'm so happy that they're doing it and it was such a special defense we had so many special guys so many characters I mean are you kidding me it's just uh it was it was fun it was fun and I can't wait to see it I want that never before seen goose footage right it's yeah. got to be out there like it's that's just it. got to be that's it that's it. One of a kind. He was one of a kind, man. I mean, um, you know, when I first met him, I hated the guy. I absolutely hated him. He made my life miserable, my first training camp. I mean, I hated him with a passion. And I don't hate anyone, but I hated Tony Saragusa. And I tell you what, once I made the football team, 
and he put his arm around me and he couldn't have been a better teammate, a better guy, but he was old school, right? You don't see that anymore. He was old school. You had to earn your stripes. And, and that's what I ended up doing. And he couldn't have been better, just the best guy and uh, the best teammate. And, uh, you know, so sad uh, that he passed away this year. Um, but uh, he was such a good guy. But at first, oh, my gosh, I mean, I was scared of him to begin with and just couldn't stand him. Yeah. I tried to avoid him all of training camp. And uh, but, you know, once you made the football team, you were one of his and he couldn't have been a better guy and a better teammate.